what actually makes a good natural clock. The first of the criteria for a good natural clock is that it has to have a known initial condition. A natural clock must also have a process with a constant rate with which measurements of age can be made. The other two requirements for a natural clock are that the process of the clock must be irreversible and it must have a known final condition. So what is radiometric dating? How does it work? Does it fit the bill? Radiometric dating works like this. It is based on the law of radioactive decay, which recognizes that some atoms of a particular chemical element spontaneously change into atoms of a different particular chemical element. The parent element is reduced to a daughter element and an alpha particle. Only igneous rocks can be used as reliable natural clocks as they have a known initial condition, all parent and no daughter. This is simply a fact of geology. When igneous rocks form, they are indeed all parent material. We also know that the rate of decay is constant, meeting the second criteria for a natural clock. Well, how do we know that it's constant? Because we've literally thrown everything and the kitchen sink at the process to try and speed it up. We've tried high and low temperatures and pressures, irradiation with x-rays and gamma rays, bombardment with high energy particles, various levels of magnetic and electric fields, and incredibly high accelerations of gravity. Conditions which would never be seen in nature on our planet. And the best we could do was acceleration by 1.5%, and even that was on a geologically irrelevant element. So the rate is, to our knowledge, constant. This is something that was admitted by the very creationists who were trying to prove that it wasn't. Decay also has a known final condition, that being all daughter material. And the process is indeed irreversible. Radiometric dating is also corroborated by a dozen or so independent methods as well, and the fossil fuel industry relies on its accuracy for finding said fossil fuels to the tune of around $250 billion annually. So this seems pretty solid. What are the objections? First up, fission tracks. Fission tracks as physical structures are simply linear tracks in rock crystals usually around 6 to 10 meters long. Fission tracks are most often caused by the spontaneous fission of the parent uranium-238 atom into two daughter atoms of palladium-119. 238 uranium is well documented in radiometric dating records with its decay into 206 lead with a half-life of about 4.5 billion years. Fission track dating has a very good initial condition being there are no fission tracks evident in newly formed rock. This is, of course, observed and confirmed today. Fission track dating also confirms the constancy requirement, as the spontaneous fission of 238 uranium atoms occurs at a constant rate under natural conditions. The spontaneous fission of 238 uranium is irreversible, as there is no known process in the universe that can fuse two palladium atoms together. The evidence of fission tracks, however, can be considered somewhat reversible, as they easily disappear with heating. This is why fission tracks can only measure the last cooling of the rock, not its age of formation. Fission track dating has a known final condition. When all of the 238 uranium atoms undergo fission, the constant rate of the clock will cease and no new tracks will appear. The rate team, a crack team of creationist geologists attempting to disprove radiometric dating, decided to take a crack at it. So the rate team decided to take a bunch of zircons and other minerals from all across the western United States in order to test whether fission track dating fell in line with the rest of the radiometric dating methods. They basically concluded, in a paper authored by Andrew Snelling, that some of the results for the Middle Cambrian samples, quote, failed to agree with previously published results showing major disagreement or discordance, the young 2005. The research team then explained that the discordance was probably related to the thermal histories of the rock and differences in measurement technique described by Snelling in 2005. Furthermore, de Young discussed the regional history from the area where the samples were collected and asserted that some of the discordance could be attributed to the fact that tectonic movement in the Colorado Plateau long after the Middle Cambrian caused the rocks to be heated above their annealing temperature and the clocks were thus reset. The ICR team went on to state that almost all other results are concurrent with dates previously obtained for the rocks using other dating techniques. From this statement, ICR admits to believing that millions of years of decay seems to have occurred in these rocks assuming a constant rate of fission. 
ICR appears to have followed standard procedures and obtained typical results from the rock samples they collected, as one cannot find any serious flaw with their methodology or the results which they obtained. And yet, here is ICR in the year 2020 touting exactly the discordant dates and nothing else. ICR is genesening here. Because here's the rub, right? The very authors cited by ICR in this paper propose reasonable, natural methods for why they got a handful of discordant dates, and they further admit that the majority of the dates corroborate typical ancient Earth measurements. So what the hell, ICR? Fission track dating is also corroborated by like a dozen other radiometric dating methods. Oopsie. So. The consensus on the entire affair of using it as a corroboratory method of dating rocks seems to be, by the admission of ICR's data as well as countless other analyses, that it works just fine. Next up, radio halos. Radio halos occur in certain types of igneous rocks such as granite that contain minerals like zircon and monazite, which can be inclusions within other minerals such as mica. It is known that the crystal lattice of these minerals commonly contains traces of certain radioactive elements. These radioactive materials can leave radiation damage in the form of discoloration in the surrounding rock. This radiation damage, or halo, appears as a fuzzy, spherical-shaped discoloration in the mineral structure emanating from the location of the radioactive material. Creationists and young Earth proponents use a specific type of pleochroic halo, purported to be caused by the radioactive element polonium, to make the claim that Earth could not be billions of years old, but must be much younger. It is important to note, however, that polonium halos do not give any specific age of the Earth, and young Earth supporters are not attempting to use them as a dating method. Instead, polonium halos are seen as a way to discount scientists' claims that the Earth has a geologic record which took billions of years to form. In short, polonium halos are not natural clocks because they cannot be said to give a specific age, but creationists in for certain things about these halos that they say is evidence of a young Earth. So polonium forms from the alpha decay of radon, which is one of the decay products of uranium. Since radon is a gas, it can migrate through small cracks in the minerals, leading to the polonium halos. The fact that these halos are found only in association with uranium, which is of course the parent mineral for producing radon, supports this conclusion, as does the fact that such halos are commonly found along cracks. When microfractures are not seen, it always seems to be when the crystals were formed in magma, which doesn't tend to crack at all. Additionally, if polonium halos truly had a nearly instantaneous origin, as suggested by Snelling, then even more examples of other polonium halo types would be expected to occur. We should see halos from 215 polonium and 211 polonium, as well as from 216 polonium and 212 polonium, but these are not found. The reason is that the radon gas atoms in these two decay series, which are the precursors for other radioactive polonium isotopes, have half-lives in the seconds, and their daughter polonium isotopes have half-lives in the seconds and microseconds, instead of around 3.5 minutes for 218 polonium and 140 days for 210 polonium in the 238 uranium decay series. However, Gentry only found the one kind of polonium halo sequence among the three possible kinds in biotite and fluorite of supposed instantaneous origin. So basically, they had an opportunity for a prediction here, but the prediction was not met. So it looks like this one is busted as well. Bummer. Now we can talk about helium in the crust. Some creationists claim there is too much helium in Earth's crust for Earth to be any more than 2 million years old. If Earth has existed for billions of years, there should be little helium left in the deeper rocks as a result of radioactive alpha decay. They claim that if God had created the Earth with the initial helium in the atmosphere, the maximum age would be even lower than 2 million years, perhaps even as little as 6,000 years. The Rate Project, which was of course co-sponsored by the Institute for Creation Research, the Creation Research Society, and Answers in Genesis, claims that the amount of helium present in minerals at different depths of the Earth's crust is simply too high to support the day age or evolutionist theories of an old Earth. They sent rock samples to a lab for helium diffusion tests, and their results were that the rock samples have too little resistance to the diffusion of helium through the rocks for the age to be greater than at most 2 million years. The conclusion reached by the Rate Project as to the reason for the increased helium is that sometime in the past few thousand years there was a period of increased radioactivity. A fundamental problem with this hypothesis, however, is that the amount of energy released during the accelerated decay proposed by the Rate team would potentially be enough to evaporate the oceans and melt the Earth's crust. 
I wonder if Stanning has considered this when proposing this flaw in radioactive decay. Likely not, as we have yet to hear from him about the heat problem. Not only that, but subsurface pressure and temperature conditions affect how quickly the helium diffuses out of zircons. Humphreys et al. selected a rock core sample from the Fenton Hill site, which Los Alamos National Laboratory evaluated in the 1970s for geothermal energy production. The area is within a few kilometers of the Valles Caldera, which has gone through several periods of faulting and volcanism. The rocks of Fenton Hill core have been fractured, brecciated, and intruded by hydrothermal veins. Excess helium is present in the rocks of the Valles Caldera. This helium may have contaminated the gneiss that Humphreys et al. studied. In short, the entire region has a very complex thermal history. Based off of the oil industry experience, it is essentially impossible to make accurate statements about the helium diffusion history of such a system. So why choose volatile rock formations known for giving bad data? This would be like choosing metamorphic rock and using dates from that to attempt to disprove radiometric dating, which requires an igneous rock. So it looks like helium doesn't really fit the bill either. So what about magnetism? This creationist argument is based on the theory that was proposed by Dr. Thomas Barnes in 1971 and then again by Humphreys in 1993. Using data obtained by MacDonald and Gunst in 1967, Dr. Barnes asserted that Earth's magnetic field has been decaying in a non-cyclic manner at an exponential rate since the beginning of creation. Barnes used the data of MacDonald and Gunst to plot an exponential curve and, by extrapolating the observed data backwards in time using his exponential decay equation, Barnes claimed that the magnetic field was approximately 40% stronger in 1000 AD than it is today. Continuing this extrapolation, Barnes stated that the Earth must not be older than 10,000 years or else the strength of the magnetic field would have been so large that it would have melted the Earth. Unfortunately for Dr. Barnes, observed scientific evidence has shown that the Earth's magnetic field has not been decaying constantly since the dawn of creation. In fact, the magnetic field has fluctuated and reversed in polarity over time, proven by evidence of periods of increasing and decreasing field energy. Due to this cyclic fluctuation, scientists have argued that the strength of the magnetic field cannot be used to determine the age of the Earth since it is, in fact, a reversible and cyclic process. However, creationists have attempted to offer a solution to this problem. Dr. Russell Humphreys, a nuclear physicist, looks to the Genesis Flood as the cause of the fluctuations in the magnetic field. Utilizing a creationist theory that the Genesis Flood was caused by the plunging of tectonic plates towards the Earth's core, Dr. Humphreys claims that the tectonic plates would have caused a sudden cooling in the outer parts of the Earth's core. This sudden cooling, he says, would have caused the convection currents to flow within the core, which would generate numerous reversals of the magnetic field over the course of thousands of years. These field reversals would have happened rapidly at the time of the flood, according to Humphreys, leading to an increase in the intensity, strength, and direction of the magnetic field until it reached a maximum at the time of Jesus Christ. The scientific community has been quick to respond to the age data presented by creationists, and they have provided several counters to the claims made by Barnes. Any flaws found in Barnes' work also discredits the work of Humphreys, since Humphreys' work is based upon that of Barnes. The first made by scientists is that Barnes used an outdated model in his analysis of the Earth's interior. By using an outdated model, any assumptions made by Barnes become instantly invalid. Second, by using McDonald's and Gunst's data, Barnes only analyzed the dipole component of the magnetic field, which is not an accurate measurement of the overall strength of the magnetic field. Third, scientists showed that the data used by Barnes more easily fits a linear curve than an exponential one, and Barnes chose the exponential curve based on incorrect assumptions. The scientific answer for the apparent decay of the magnetic field was given by Dr. Walter Elasser, a physicist at the University of Utah. According to Elasser, Earth's magnetic field is generated by a dynamo within the Earth's core. This dynamo used to be heavily understudied, leading to creationist criticism. But time keeps on slipping, 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 and we find out that the dynamo theory is in fact robust. Magnetism ain't gonna cut it. At long last, we reach cold material, which is Baumgartner's theory, and it still doesn't work without miracles, as Baumgartner himself admits. The thermal diffusivity of the Earth would have to increase 10,000-fold just to get the subduction rates that he proposes, and something would have to cause the advance and retreat of the magma bubble. Miracles would also have been necessary to cool the new ocean floor and raise sedimentary mountains in months rather than the millions of years it would ordinarily take. Baumgartner himself estimated a release of 10 to the 28th joules from the subduction processes alone. 
This is more than enough to boil off all of the oceans. In addition, Baumgartner postulated that the mantle was much hotter before the flood, and the heat would have to go somewhere. So these objections to radiometric dating are pitiful and outdated. Hey pal, you just blowing from stupid town?